A secret meeting at the Toyota headquarters is called. The entire leadership roster is present and waiting with bated breath. In a few sentences, Toyota's company chairman lays out a plan that will change Toyota and the entire luxury market forever. Forever. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Lexus LS 400. Hey, hell those people. I'm a freaking Viking now. Remember all those sweet real-time strategy games from the 90s? Well, Vikings War of Clans is like those, but on your phone. And you get to meet or defeat over 20 million online players. Personally, I prefer defeat with never-ending fighting, just like my house. Support Donut Media by downloading Vikings for free from the links in the description below. To sweeten the deal, I'm gonna give you 200 gold coins and a Hurstvik. That'll come in handy when I'm smashing on you with my hammer. Atop the buffest horse you've ever seen. Hashtag buff horses. It was 1983, 17 years before Post Malone was even born. The oil crisis had come and gone, and as a result, Japan's manufacturers and their funny little fuel-efficient cars made a nice little foothold in the US. Japan's US market share had jumped from 11% in 1969 to 28% in 1980. That's like almost as big a jump as I can do. Ram Charger. But Toyota's jump terrified the American automakers. I mean, they believed now that American consumers were used to Japanese brands, they wouldn't see any reason for going back to the big three. So they lobbied the Reagan administration to um, remedy the situation. You wanted law and order in this town, you've got it. In 1981, the US government mandated a restricted import of Japanese vehicles. Japan reluctantly agreed to a voluntary restraint agreement. And as a result, they were allowed to import only 1.68 million cars a year to the US. Now this kind of sucked for Japanese brands, especially Toyota. Japan's currency was getting weaker every year too, and that certainly was not gonna help. Ichiro Suzuki, not the baseball player, was Toyota's lead project engineer, and he had an idea he thought would be a real home run. <laughs> He believed that German luxury makers, BMW and Mercedes, had it too easy over the past few years. And they had gotten a little comfy, a little complacent. Ichiro figured they would never suspect Toyota could design a luxury car. So that's what they do. A real curveball. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, James. Didn't you just say that Japan's money was weak? He's right, I was wondering that. Yeah, it was gonna be really expensive for Toyota to design a whole new car. But it was actually the weak yen that could make this plan work. Germany's money was pretty strong. So for them to build a car, then sell it in the US, it would cost them a lot. And then they had to sell it for a lot. But for Toyota, it would be relatively expensive for them to build. But when they sold it in a country with a stronger currency like America, they would make a lot of profit even if they sold the car at a much lower price than their German competition. This is how Toyota would make a ton of money in spite of the roadblocks ahead of them. So they got to work. Toyota named the project F1, not for Formula One, but for flagship one. They enlisted the talents of 3,700 technicians and engineers, split into 24 distinct teams. The new car would not share any components from any previous Toyota models. They had to start from scratch. But how would they know what to build? How could they understand what Americans want in a luxury car while living all the way over? Well, they'd have to camp out overseas and immerse themselves inside one of America's largest luxury strongholds. A place where everyone only accepts the best. A land of no compromise. Orange County, California. California, California, here they come. The Toyota team spent a month in a rented house in Laguna Beach to observe the people they were aiming to win over. The elusive Lagoonian drove Mercedes or a BMW and enjoyed an 
elegant lifestyle. <laughs> Toyota also took into consideration how their cars would look on American roads and had to fit in and complement the scenery around it. Like me at a wedding. I get along with the moms, I get along with the dads. Smoke the cigar over here. Dance with the kid over here. Okay, Grandma Ruth, yeah, you got next dance. So with their research done, they went back to Japan to put the new luxury car together. Toyota had their first running prototype in 1985. It was powered not by a little four cylinder or V6 like people had come to expect from Toyota, but something um, a little bigger. Toyota knew that their car needed a lot of power. It was gonna be a big boy. <laughs> and potential luxury buyers weren't gonna be stoked with the slow ride. So engineers spent years designing the new engine. It had an aluminum block, aluminum heads, dual overhead cams, a sophisticated fuel injection system, and most importantly, eight cylinders. All in all, Toyota spent $400 million developing the new 1UZ FE engine. And it's an awesome engine. <laughs> Toyota built 450 prototype cars and tested them extensively in the US and over in Germany. They spent literally days driving up and down the Autobahn at full throttle, making sure the new engine could handle it. When they drove the prototypes around, they were either unmarked or wearing Cressida badges, so nobody would suspect it's an entirely new car. Shh. But apparently that didn't stop curious drivers from following the F1 for miles when they were testing it out. They just had to know what it was. They shipped some cars to Canada and Sweden to test the traction control and anti-lock brake systems in extreme cold weather. For two winters, the cars lived in some of the coldest places in the world to make sure the systems held up in those conditions. But a flagship luxury car also needs performance handling. So Toyota brought IndyCar and NASCAR legend, Roger <laughs> out to their proving grounds. Roger and the Toyota team put the car through its paces and worked out the final suspension tweaks. By the late 80s, the car was pretty much done and ready to go on sale. Huh, speaking of on sale, you wanna brag about the fact that you don't like vowels? We got a hearse purse shirt. Boom, lightning, 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 lightning. Eat hot dogs with confidence. You can spill mustard on this one and no one will even notice. Go to donutmedia.com or click the link below or go to my Instagram at James Pumphrey. Follow me uh, and there's a link in my bio. Now please enjoy the rest of the LS400 episode. It's the late 80s. The car is ready to sell. But there was a problem. The name. Those highfalutin luxury buyers back in Laguna Beach probably didn't want to be seen driving around in a Toyota. Oh, nice Toyota. Their new car needed a new brand name to be sold under. The Toyota Brain Trust came up with a list of like 200 potential plates for a new brand until they whittled it down to five. Four of them, I can't remember. They chose Lexus. That sounds nice. The model, the F1, also needed a new name. So they just did what every other luxury brand does. LS 400. What's the LS mean? Probably luxury sedan. I don't know. What's RX mean, or E mean, or GS mean, or V mean, or R mean. What is life mean? So now it was time to hit the showroom. Upon its debut in 1989, shout out Taylor Swift, the LS400 really fricked up the whole darn ball game. The 250 hertz per LS400 was faster from zero to 60 than the BMW 740i. Arguably looked better than the Mercedes 300 SE, not the AMG obviously, and had way more tech than whatever Cadillac had to offer. Drivers loved the quiet cabin and exceptionally smooth performance of the new V8. It was so smooth, in fact, that you could balance a glass of wine on the engine while it ran. How many times have you wanted to hang out and sip wine when your engine's running and you're next to it? It's fancy, it's a luxury car. 
That's what you do. So in the LS's first year, Lexus sold over 42,000 of them. And by the very next year, had passed both BMW and Mercedes in sales in the US. Critics found it hard to believe, and I did too, but Toyota, a Japanese company, produced a luxury car that was as good as its German competitors for just under $40,000. Gentlemen, mission accomplished! Woo! <laughs> Lexus's rivals were dumbfounded. Cadillac bought an LS400 for research purposes. After taking the whole thing apart, they figured that they themselves wouldn't be able to build a car like it with GM's current manufacturing process. The Germans were panicking too. Mercedes dropped their US pricing 10% as a response and rushed to add features to the brand new 1991 S-Class. They went way over budget and their chief engineer actually lost his job as a result. Compared to other luxury car brands, the LS400 was so affordable that BMW accused them of selling it at lower than cost because they didn't believe that Toyota was making any profit. The second gen LS400 debuted in 1995. It looked pretty similar to the first one, but underneath, Lexus had tweaked or redesigned about 90% of the car. It was quieter, stronger, and the engine was a little bit more powerful. The new LS400 was over 200 pounds lighter, or as we say at Donut, one Nolan lighter than the first gen, and faster from zero to 60 by a full second. Lexus had done it again, making another great car. The LS400 was still cheaper than the competition, but the base price was increased by about 17%. To make matters a little worse, the US was also threatening Japan with tariffs, which would skyrocket the price to over $100,000. That's in 1995 money, the year that Post Malone was born. That would obviously, absolutely, tank the Lexus brand. Lucky for them, an agreement was reached between the two governments and the company dodged that bullet. The year 2000, Y2K had come and gone. The Backstreet Boys black and blue record was on repeat in my stereo. And Lexus revealed the third gen LS model, now called the LS430. It was the first Lexus to employ active cruise control, so you didn't have to constantly adjust your speed in traffic, leaving your right ankle free to do whatever else you need it to do. Some of us like to sew while we drive. Or you can weld. Look, Lexus drivers don't have time to only drive. We like to sit in obscene comfort and reflect on life's great mysteries. Hashtag comfy gang. The LS430 had a new engine too. A bigger, more powerful 4.3 liter V8 making 290 horses. The body was completely restyled and much more aerodynamic than previous gens. The Porsche 918 and the McLaren P1. Those are pretty cool cars, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. But why am I talking about them right now? Uh, well, they have V8s, uh-huh, and they're, uh, Hybrids? Yes! But they definitely weren't the first. The Lexus LS 600H was. Lexus was ready to refresh the LS once again, and in 2006, dropped the fourth gen model. The new LS 460 got an upgraded 4.6 liter V8. And for the first time, the LS also got a bigger engine option. The LS 600H had a five liter V8 mated to an electric motor for a combined power of 442 Hersey's, as well as being ultra low emission certified. So you save the world and you can cruise in the hove lane. The LS 600H did zero to 60 in five and a half seconds, successfully bridging the gap between agro sedan performance and the illusion of fuel sipping economy. It did about 25 miles per gallon combined. Lexus continued to innovate. <laughs> the average price people paid for the smaller 460 was around 80 grand, and the 600H started at 104,000 bones. Lexus was no longer the little guy. 
The current gen Lexus LS is offered in three models. LS350, LS500, and LS500H. The fifth gen is the first LS to be offered without a V8. The LS500 has a twin turbocharged V6 making 415 hertz pers, and the hybrid 500H is naturally aspirated, making just a little less. The LS is still going strong. And now, it's not just the big boy, he's one of the big dogs. I really want an LS400, really bad. They're sick, they're the best, they're honestly, depending on how you look at it, one of the best cars ever made, and a great story. Fine, we did it, we finally did it. Nathan Wickman from the r slash donut subreddit, leave us alone. This guy posted a picture of his car every day until he didn't up to speed on it. That's not gonna work in the future, but if you're creative and you ask us in creative ways, you might just get an episode that you want. Head over to our subreddit, r slash donut media. Hey, if you're already subscribed, welcome back. If you're not, and you liked this, you wanna see more, hit the subscribe button. Go to donutmedia.com to buy a shirt or go to my Instagram, at James Pumphrey. Follow me while you're there. It's in the link in my bio. Colby, please put at James Pumphrey on the screen. Thank you. We make content every day. Check out these two episodes. I love you.